Today on Between the Lines, a guide to igniting the writer within us all with my guest, Barbara DeMarco Barrett. I'm Barry Kibrick. The deep desire to write is oftentimes buried within us. Barbara, with her book, Pen on Fire, shows ways to ignite our spirits so that creativity may flow from our pens to the page. But I'm a writer today because I was a reader when I was 11 years old. And it was... You do, need to, need, you do not need to prove your state of happiness to anybody. Most of these speeches were as much as a month in preparation. The characters, the heroes in this book are seekers of truth in, in a story that, that involved a lot of corruption. You don't get a chance to really talk about what's real. And it's a person. Barbara DeMarco Barrett teaches creative writing at the University of California, Irvine, and hosts the radio show, Writers on Writing. With her book, Pen on Fire, a guide to igniting the writer within, Barbara gives us the philosophy and the practical exercises to help you become the writer you deep down inside have always wanted to be. Barbara? I have a confession I have to make. Right. I, I hinted something that I, I was going to say I had to tell you I didn't want to discuss. When I introduce you, and, and my guests aren't here for the introductions, they take place before or after you get here, and I introduce you as Pen on Fire, the, the, the book's name, a guide to igniting the writer within. And I left out a busy woman's guide, mm -hmm. and I'll tell you why. And I don't want to deceive anyone, except I wanted to make sure that every guy in the audience stuck around at least to hear this, because except for one or two moments in this book, this will help every guy that wants to be a writer as sure. well. So I just wanted to set the record <laughs> straight. I had to confess, I didn't do that in the introduction. It is written towards for a woman, but I am telling you I have read many books on writing and you just take out that word and any guy can sit there and That's have true. no problem about it. The one difference is the time. Mm -hmm. The way you utilize time you say that a woman doesn't have that ability to save that time, the caretaking, all of that, you have to squeeze it in a little bit more. Women just have a habit of putting things off. The male writers I know tend to, if, if they want to write, they tend to find the time and just schedule it in, whether, it, whether they're getting up at four in the morning and, and writing until they go to work at six or till they have to get the children ready help the wife get the children ready or whatever it is, but women put everything off and they do all the other stuff and then if they have time at the end of the day, which who does? Because by the end of the day you're worn out and you want to do something that doesn't take mind work. But you're s very careful because, you know, it's sort of you have to take the time right. and it's very little. That's what you really, you've got the 15 minute principle and you say in 15 minutes a day, you'll end the year with a brand new novel, and that's all it takes. It takes 15 minutes a day to write a page, right? A page a day, 365 pages, you have a rough draft of a book. And I think that's, that really escapes most people. Everyone's waiting till they retire, or they have a month off, or they quit work, or they do something, you know, where their time frees up. And I wrote a lot of this book when my son was a baby and a toddler, and then he started school. And I would just take pieces of time. And I found that I could do it. And then I started having my students do it. And I saw that instead of going for a certain number of words a day or a certain number of pages, because that, you can do it maybe for a week or two. And then it, it's not working anymore. I started thinking, what about just using time, those blips of time that, that we have, that we all have, that we don't use. We either get on the phone or we email or we do something else. Now I wrote down the paralysis of analysis when you <laughs> stare at that blank page and a few things I'm going to talk about. One of them has to do with uh, the guest you met earlier, in the, uh, Ron White in Lincoln, sure. who I said, uh, you know, he stole from everything and, and, and copied from everything. He never started with a blank page. Hmm. He actually used always some other form of writing to even jumpstart it. Sure. But we're going to talk about what to do in, in the exercises that you have here. By the way, there is philosophy and exercises. That what, that's what makes this book up. Hmm. And uh, some of the philosophy even, I think, holds true for even someone who's not writing. 
And I want to even start with one of them right now. As I said, the paralysis of the blank page. But you bring out two things, procrastination and perfection. And they both seem to be the same sides of the coin. Because if you're waiting for the perfect time, for the perfect moment, for the perfect setting, for the per you're never going to write. And in a sense, you don't usually associate perfectionists with someone who is procrastinating, mm -hmm. but that's what really is happening. You're not writing, you're waiting for the right moment. Or you're waiting until whatever it is you wanna write gels in your mind. So that you don't wanna just write it out and fill up the page. You think that somehow the mind has to have it clear what's going to come out before it comes out. And, and that's also that perfectionistic um, part of us that, that really just, doesn't want to have to work at it. I mean, we want it to be perfect because we, you know, writing is hard work, and so, and it takes a lot of revision. The best writing has been gone over and gone over, and and somehow we, we grow. If we've made it to adulthood and we've been writing most of our lives, we think it should come out a lot, a lot nicer and better and more perfect than it does. Sure, because you know you're a kid in school and you write your paper because you studied and the teacher sure. gives you an A and therefore you think you're this great writer. And as I said earlier, we were talking about Lincoln, he revised, revised, mm -hmm. revised. In fact, Ron said up to two to three years sometimes for a short speech. Sure. That's what it takes. Good writing that looks simple has most likely been worked over. And because it looks so good and reads so well and so smoothly, the reader who perhaps is also a writer thinks, oh, I, I can't do that. I'm, I'm not that good. It's not gonna come out like that for me, when in fact, it doesn't for anyone. You, you say small chunks. I love that concept of small changes, small chunks. And you believe really that by doing these little small chunks, you can concentrate more on them, you can focus more, and you don't feel this burden that is weighing on all those who want to start writing. If you think you're just going to write a 15 for 15 minutes and you even see the term free writing, which mm -hmm. is just allowing it to flow in a small chunk like that, it's so much easier to digest. Well, you said the word that, that really is the problem for a lot of us, and that is think, because we think too much. We want to write, and so we think so much about it that what we're going to write and what we're going to do, that we, we think ourselves away from the desk because it's just it's too burdensome instead of sitting down and doing the free writing and letting it pour out and see what happens and having fun with it. We're thinking about it. On that note, you may I, I want to quote a line from you. Sure. Very little of writing is waiting for the muse to hit you. I think that's what you're referring to. Mm -hmm. You're waiting for that flash, you're waiting for that moment, you're waiting for that epiphany, right. and very little of writing has to do with that. I like to say the muse is very busy these days, and to bring the muse into your, your office or your kitchen table or wherever you're writing means you have to be in the chair. And if you're not in the chair, you're not going to be hit with inspiration. Most of the time, at least I'm not. I have to be sitting there working on something or even out at a cafe with my notebook or in the park or at the beach, somewhere writing. You go further. You even say some, one of the things you wrote. You found a paper bag, a, sh a supermarket shopping bag. Right in the trash. And, you, and, you, and the trash, <laughs> and you simply filled up both sides of the bag because something at that moment was ready to come out. And I had a deadline. And that's where the timer comes in. We use a timer a lot. I have everybody use timers because the timer serves as a deadline if you don't have a deadline. If you're not a published writer yet and you don't have a magazine waiting for your article or story or essay, the, setting the timer for 15 minutes and, and not paying attention to time and writing for that 15 minutes is your deadline so that it, the more you do that, the more confident you become that you can finish a piece of writing, however light, however um, unthought out it is. Um, I'm, I find pieces of paper wherever I need them if I need to get something done or if I need to take notes and, you know, because we don't remember things. You know, one of the words you use and you throughout the book is the word fear because that is what para paralyzes everyone, but the writer in particular looking at that blank page, it's fear. 
Yeah. It's fear of not being the great American novelist. It's fear of not taking the chance to become the great American sure. novelist. No matter how, what side of the coin you're looking at, fear seems to creep into a lot of people who can't make the leap from the dream to the reality. Yeah, that that's, I mean, that's a part of everything, isn't it? Whatever. Right, that's why I said this is yeah. not only for writers. Right. If you grab these concepts, it'll help you through life, whatever you're going to do. Uh, yeah, I mean, you can really use these concepts for everything. And, and with fearing that you won't write the great American novel or you won't be the writer you thought you or that you would love to be, it stops you. And so... I, I quote Frank Herbert, who wrote Dune in this book, where he said something like, fear is the mind killer. And you have to go through fear and, and come out on the other side to really achieve anything worthwhile. And writers have such a fear. Maybe writers are more self-conscious or self-aware or think too much. And I think when writers start, or new writers start writing and see how hard it is, they have the fear that they won't be able to hang in there for the long haul. Long haul, that's the other fear, and you're very, very careful to give us so many examples of this. The fear that if I'm not famous by 30, right. I'm not gonna be a great writer. And you give example and example. Of, this is the one, one of the very few, in fact, crafts that you can really start even later in life. You don't have to be successful by 30. Writing is sure. a different process. It is different, and it's funny. I'm listening to um, a, a book on tape by Harriet Dorr, who wrote, um, Consider This Senora. She won a National Book Award, I believe, for um, um, another book earlier, but she didn't come into her own until she was 73. Now, you know, most of us might want to be um, more successful before we're 73 without our writing, but just, it doesn't matter. You have to enjoy it and enjoy the journey of writing and worry about all that some other time or when you start worrying, forget about it you know, and I write. Don't, I don't know if it's the same person because you give an example in the book of someone about that age and I, you said she was writing until she was in her 90s. So that's a 20 year career no yeah, matter how you look right. at it. And, and we fear that what if what I'm writing doesn't do anything? I'm spending a year, two years on this novel and I've written hundreds of pages. What if nothing happens? And my feeling is something has happened. What has happened is you've probably become a better writer. Maybe you, it's not meant to, maybe your first book is not meant to be published. I have two unpublished books before Pen on Fire, and now I thank God those were never published because now I would feel totally embarrassed to have those books out there. They brought me to where I am, and, and that's fine. It wasn't fine at the time. But it's fine now. I had Victor Villasenor on, and mm -hmm. his first book took 40 years to be published. Meanwhile, he published <laughs> at least 20 <laughs> others. So it's, it's very true. You, sure. can't, you can't do that. You know, um, you say that this business is not for anyone who gives up easily. Right. So it's even if you're struggling all that time with your writing, you must keep going. So it's not just you can start later and get published later. It's do you have that fortitude within you because if you don't, don't become a writer. There's somebody famous said, um, and it's oft repeated, um, I, I want to have written. I don't want to write, but I want to have written. You know, of course, we all want a book out there. We all, I mean, so many of us, unpublished, before we're published, want that book. But the only thing that has that happen is if you sit and you work daily, or most days. May I read a quote that's not yours, sure. but you put it in the book? Yeah, it's course. from Rita Mae Brown, and I yeah. think it hits this right home. It says, never hope more than you work. Mm -hmm. Boy, how many times have you, you, you just gave those examples? Boy, I hope I'm going to write that book. I, well, if you're not working at it, right. stop the hoping. Never hope more than you work. And we put it off. It's a beautiful day, especially in Southern California, other parts of the country. It's a beautiful day. Our our family, uh, people close to us want to drag us out to the park or the beach, we want to go. And, and that's when the decision has to be made, do I go or did I get my writing done today? And if not, maybe I need to stay at my desk. And so often when I was working on Pen on Fire and other work that's been unpublished, um, my husband and son will be going off to the beach and say, come on, we're gone. I say, I have to do this today because if I don't sit here 
then nothing will happen. But when you make that commitment to sit there, you then give us this advice that you must have a mental partition between yourself and the process of writing and that constant nagging voice that goes on in all of our minds, right. most of it filled with self-doubt and fears. All those voices, there's so many negative voices trying to pull us down and, and stop us. And I don't, know, I don't know where those come from, but when they start up in me, what I tend to do is sit down and write because that's what quiets them. And I, I think once you can stop those voices and just say, yeah, yeah, okay, go away now, then you can get on with it. Now, as I said, the book has all sorts of philosophical approaches to the craft of writing, but it also has exercises that people can do. We're never going to be able to get through all of them, but I have a few that I'd like to, to share with people. Okay. The first one is the written snapshot, and the reason why I bring that up, it, it, it almost seemed like the easiest one to think of, but there was a line you give in there where you're talking about you know, a person who doesn't have the camera with them at that moment, if they can write a written snapshot, that memory is always there and it's even safer than a digital camera because mm -hmm. you know you've captured it. So I thought that was an interesting exercise. The first one I wanted to talk to you about is written snapshot. Mm -hmm. Well, so much of good writing is um, in the details. It's not the abstractions of, um, it was a beautiful day, but it's, it's um, describing specifically what the light was like or, the, w or the, the smell of the ocean was like. And when you get down those specific details, then you've created a picture. And it's a picture that others will be able to read as well and, and see what you saw. You know, there's also a thing. I, a lot of people, when they think of creative writing, they think that it all must just flow from within. Now you say there's lots of exercises in here that show you how to bring out that inner self, but there's the second in, in the book is actually something called research. And I think it's mm -hmm. so important for people to realize that even if you are writing a complete work of fiction, something that you are just making up, there still is so much research you could probably do to enhance that material. And, and the research is a way of, of inspiring yourself, too, especially if you feel that I don't have any wonderful ideas that I want, want to write about. What do I do? I, my life is boring. Well, go do some research. See what piques your interest and, and where you can go with it. Go to the library. Go to a historical society. Have some, tell someone what you're doing. Um, and, and see what they hand you. They might hand you a biography of someone you've never heard of. Peek into it. What happens? And, and use that to prompt you. You know, with that, uh, the, the writer too, like, like all virtually of our arts, it's part art, mm -hmm. it's part craft. And you are again very careful to bring in here the craft of it. And one of them you just actually intimated and I guess it's the art mixing the craft almost identically because you were talking about writers being more empathetic and sympathetic and you have a thing called Composition 101 and that's all about empathy and compassion. Uh, actually, it was called Compassion mm -hmm. 101. Sorry about that. And it's a must for any great writer. So the thing that sometimes keeps you out of that moment or out of or into that otherness is also the, the yin or the yang of being a great writer is that compassion and that empathy you have. Sure. I think in that chapter I talked about Janet Fitch, um, a novelist who said to me that she became a better writer when she started being more compassionate. Because before that she was seeing maybe situations or people as stereotypes. And when she started having more compassion, she was able to go deeper into, into character and into into her writing to be able to feel it and not judge it. Two things I wanted to talk about because I think if they're not made clear, they could be confusing. One is you say find your voice. The other is point of view. Explain the difference of finding your voice and what is a point of view because sometimes you could think, boy, if I had a different point of view, but you don't mean that. The point of view you're referring to is how you're going to write from which position yourself from someone else right. as the point of view, but finding your voice must come before you even have a point of view. 
Well, finding your voice, well, voice, a writer's voice is their thumbprint. And I think that's what we're all after as writers, um, is, is being able to write like us and not like the writers we admire or our mentor or the books that we read and love. Um, so finding your voice is going into that. For instance, a lot of the time when we email somebody, we are writing in our own voice. We're emailing someone we're comfortable with, a good friend, and we're writing like we talk, perhaps. And that's the closest to um, your voice that you get, probably just in, in the course of a day writing. A lot of the time when writers are starting out, um, they're trying to write like someone else, like what they think a good writer would write like. Instead of, instead of really accepting their voice, the way they see things, their 